Well, hello, and welcome to the inaugural presentation of the 2016 CF Discovery Series. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sue Langrath, the Executive Director of Cystic Fibrosis Research Incorporated, CFRI, and I'm very, very delighted to welcome you here tonight. Um, it's actually a very special night because it is the first night that we are hosting the CF Discovery Series in our home studio. So you're all part of a, a very important occasion. So thank you for being here. Um, I am pleased to welcome all of you here in the, in the studio and also our online guests as well for participating um, and learning about this very important subject. So we have a very special program for you tonight, but before getting started, there are several people that I would like to acknowledge and thank. I would like to thank Vertex Pharmaceuticals and Genentech and Chiesa USA for sponsoring tonight's event, as well as Abvi and Cystic Fibrosis Services, a Walgreens Alliance Pharmacy for providing additional program support. And uh, when you have time after the program, you might peruse some of the materials that we have from our sponsors. I think you'll find it very, very interesting. And as always, we urge you to work together with your healthcare team. Please note that no information presented here tonight is intended for a patient's diagnosis or treatment. Tonight's program is being produced by your CFRI Live team. Scott Wakefield, David Suhu, and Mary Convento. Mary will be fielding the online questions and she will be participating with us later in the program. Uh, so this is happening in real time, which is pretty exciting. And at the end of the presentations, I encourage all of you online here in the studio to ask questions of our very knowledgeable presenters. So this is a great opportunity to hear from experts in the field. Online viewers, this is for you. Please click in the chat box on your screen and type in your questions. Mary will keep track of them and ask them at the end of the presentation. So are you ready to get started? Gastrointestinal issues are very common among those with CF and they can have a very significant impact on one's quality of life. So we are extremely fortunate to have with us tonight Michelle Strobe, a registered dietitian at the Adult CF Center at Stanford, as well as Sarah Maudlin, a CFRI researcher who is receiving her medical degree at Turo University. Together, they will share their wealth of information and insights as they present gastrointestinal health and cystic fibrosis and integrated approach. So to get started, let's welcome Michelle Strobe to the podium. Thank you. I'll switch places with you. Okay. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm looking forward to uh, presenting today on a subject that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, I am the uh, CF dietitian at the Adult CF Center at Stanford. Um, gastrointestinal issues are something that I just discuss with my patients on a daily basis, and so I think they're really important to overall health for our CF patients, specifically the adults that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Sarah and I t decided to um, really hone in on DOS or distal intestinal obstructive syndrome that I'll discuss in detail in this presentation um, because it is something that a lot of our patients don't know a lot about and it's something that's very important and something to really hopefully educate the population about and prevent going forward. So today I'm going to be presenting DOS, a dietitian's perspective. Today we're going to overview what DOS is. What, why DOS is only seen in our cystic fibrosis patients, the signs and symptoms of DOS, common triggers of DOS, treatment and prevention, its impact on nutrition, and also, sorry, when to call your medical team. To start, DOS is something we refer to in the hospital, and a lot of our patients don't actually know what this stands for. It's distal intestinal obstructive syndrome. This is specific to our cystic fibrosis patients and specifically our pancreatic insufficient patients. We do this, see this sometimes in our pancreatic sufficient patients, but it's very rare. It's mostly our insufficient patients. And I'll kind of detail why that is in just a few slides. The lifetime prevalence of DOS is about 16% in our CF adults, and we see about 10 to 20% of our post-transplant patients have an episode of DOS at some point. Oftentimes, after transplant, a lot of things change in the gut. The gut slows down. There's different medications that are on board, and this is why we see an increased occurrence of DOS in our post-transplant patients. DOS is basically a type of constipation that is caused by a buildup of mucus in the intestines. 
it can cause either a complete or an incomplete blockage of stool. And what's important to know is the stool blockage is actually at the junction of the small intestine, um, where the small intestine ends and the colon begins. Why this is important is it's different than constipation. Regular constipation is really just affecting the colon, and it doesn't really involve the small intestine. And this is where it becomes a little bit more uh, significant rather than constipation. The onset of symptoms of DOS can be very sudden and can cause extreme discomfort. My patients will sometimes discuss the symptoms of DOS as extreme sharp stabbing pain. Um, it will be something similar to contractions in pregnancy, some patients say. It will also cause something so severe that it may cause doubling over in pain. Ooh, I'm sorry, I don't know why my slides keep moving. Uh, reoccurrence of DOS is very common. We see that once a patient has one episode of DOS, oftentimes we will see another reoccurrence and another. Uh, this is why it's very important to see the signs and symptoms, know how to prevent this, and work with the medical team to make sure that it doesn't occur again. So CF uh, is specific, or DOS is specific to our cystic fibrosis patients for several reasons. The first of which is the incidence of meconium ileus at birth actually increases the risk of DOS in our uh, CF adults and also children. The risk of incurrence actually increases about 18 to 44 percent just with the incidence of meconium ileus at birth. Additionally, pancreatic insufficiency, which we see in about 90 percent of our CF patients requiring enzymes, also increases the risk of DOS. There are several reasons for this. First and foremost, missing enzymes, skipping enzymes, or underdosing of enzymes will lead to malabsorption. Additionally, even with the perfect use of pancreatic enzymes, perfect dosing, taking them every single time, there's still a little bit of malabsorption that occurs. With this malabsorption, this can add to a sticky gut, which can cause some blockage of stool, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Additionally, at baseline, the CFTR gene mutation leads to several different GI uh, disorders, in, uh, increased, uh, I'm sorry, impaired intestinal motility, so slowing down of the gut will actually happen at baseline. Additionally, impaired intestinal secretion. So impaired intestinal secretion means there's not as much fluid that is drawn into the gut, and this causes a dry, sticky gut. The kind of combination of factors of malabsorption with pancreatic insufficiency in addition to a dry and sticky gut, this leads to harder stools that are harder to pass through the colon and the small intestine. Signs and symptoms of DOS are something we try to um, impress on our patients quite frequently at the CF Center. Um, we try and assess them early on. I apologize, I'm not sure why it keeps moving. We try and increase that or uh, catch them early on when it's just the first symptom that we see here, decreased number of stools. We like to catch it early before it kind of progresses into further DOS, which I'll talk about in a few slides. The first sign and symptom we usually see is decreased number or frequency of stools. Oftentimes a patient will have two to three normal medium-sized stools a day. And they'll come to me, they'll come to the team, and they'll say, I'm having one to two stools a day. They're smaller in volume. They're harder to pass. <clears throat> or maybe they won't have a stool for 24 to 48 hours. This is the really first, the si first sign and symptom we see. Beyond that, we'll have patients uh, explain that they're having cramping or abdominal pain, usually in the right lower side of their belly. It's usually below their belly button and oftentimes in the right side. The pain will continue to worsen, it won't get better, and it can cause, again, extreme pain. We oftentimes see watery and loose stools that don't relieve the abdominal pain or cramping. Nausea and vomiting oftentimes follow um, these symptoms. Inability to tolerate food, decreased appetite or abdominal fullness. A patient may say they're having just a few bites of food and they're just too full to even eat beyond breakfast, for example. We oftentimes see bloating or abdominal distension. Sometimes uh, patients will come in and say they feel like they have a pregnant belly because they're so distended. We do have common triggers of DOS that we really correlate with these symptoms. First and foremost, dehydration. This can be either dehydration at baseline, so poor hydration at baseline, a patient who maybe drinks four ounces to eight ounces of water on a daily basis, Additionally, we can also see dehydration with inadequate replacement of fluids. Oftentimes in the summer, we see more episodes of DOS because there's more sweating, more fluid losses. 
my CFers who are athletic, who are athletic and athletes, they'll go and they'll do a lot of exercise regimen. They'll sweat a lot and not replace those fluids. And this is causing dehydration, which may be a trigger for DOS. Additionally, discontinuation of bowel regimen. This is something we see often. Somebody who normally takes Miralax, for example, every day, go lightly, Senna, whatever their bowel regimen is, they do it every day, every few days, and for whatever reason, they stop. This is a common trigger for DOS. The regimen is really important to main consistency, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Malabsorption, again, is something I mentioned with pancreatic insufficiency, leads to a sticky gut. The missing enzymes or inadequate dosing of enzymes can certainly lead to DOS. Surgery is a common trigger. Uh, regimens, uh, medications that actually are on board or pain medications that are on board after a surgery can cause uh, slowing of the gut and this can kind of slow transit of stool through the colon. Immobilization or reduced activity. This oftentimes is times when our CFRs are sick and they're in bed more often. So one of my CFRs may be really active normally when they're on a day-to-day -day basis, they can get an exacerbation and what they normally do day-to-day, -day, they're in bed more often, they're not as active, and this is oftentimes when we see some uh, triggers of DOS. Treatment is very important to keep in mind of DOS. Um, one thing I do want to note is DOS is easily misdiagnosed by those who are unfamiliar with the condition. So I strongly recommend if you are part of a CF center and you have any of the signs and symptoms or you know anybody who is part of a CF center and you see the signs and symptoms to contact your CF team right away and just kind of work through it with them. The reason for this is if we diagnose it early enough and it's incomplete DOS, we can usually triage it over the phone with oral laxatives. Usually we use something like Miralax or Go Lightly. Again, lots of different bowel regimens we can get on board. And this is usually done at home over the phone. Your medical team will talk to you over the phone, titrate your Miralax, titrate your Go Lightly, your Senna, whatever bowel regimen you use, so that you can cleanse your intestines of the impacted stool. If it's diagnosed later, um, and we suspect complete DO, so complete blockage of the bottom of the small intestine or the colon, a clean out is likely required, and this oftentimes requires hospitalization. The first thing we'll do when we suspect complete DOS is an abdominal x-ray. We do an abdominal x-ray just to make sure what's, to see what's going on in the gut, to see what's going on in the abdomen. If it is a complete blockage, if it's an incomplete blockage, what's going on. We'll follow that usually with enemas and laxatives. We'll do some IV hydration to make sure there's lots of fluids on board. And sometimes we'll have to place a nasogastric tube to decompress the stomach, to keep decompress um, the small intestine, and also to help with the nausea. Oftentimes, this nasogastric tube will also help to administer our laxatives directly into the stomach rather than drinking some of them, especially if there's an inability to tolerate anything by mouth. Prevention is something that I really like to talk to my patients about almost every time I see them in-house or also in clinics. Um, strict adherence to the enzyme regimen or adequate enzyme coverage is very, very important. Skipping enzymes is definitely a common trigger, as I mentioned, and this is something to be avoided. We're all human. You know, anybody who takes pancreatic enzymes is going to forget every once in a while, but making sure you get on a good regimen with this is really important to prevent this malabsorption or any sticky stools. It's also important to talk to your team about any changes in stooling, any floating stools, any greasy stools, any smaller stools. It's very important to kind of make sure you talk to your team about this and prevent any episodes of DOS. Hydration, super important. I know I've mentioned this a few times, but it's a really important key to preventing DOS. Making sure you're increasing uh, hydration in the summer months or during exercise. Consistency of a bowel regimen is very, very important. Anybody who's at the CF Center at Stanford knows this Bristol stool scale that's on the, uh, on the slide right here. This is a tool we use at almost every clinic visit. Our goal is for two to three bowel movements of the Bristol stool scale type three or four every single day. Any change in those stooling habits, it's the time to really call us and work with us so that we can adjust the bowel regimen so that it works for you. Dietary changes can be prevention, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. And also good sugar control, blood sugar control in our diabetic patients. Impact of nutrition is a really important part of DOS specifically to me. Um, oftentimes, these episodes of DOS 
are pretty traumatic. There's a lot of vomiting, there's nausea, there's distension, there's pain, there may be a nasogastric tube that's placed. And sometimes we don't really know what the trigger is, um, and this can create a fear of food. I see this oftentimes. So it's something that's really important for myself and the patient to work together with, figuring out what the trigger is and what I can take out of their diet, what I can add back into their diet, so that we can really work together to make sure the high calorie needs of CF are met, but we prevent another episode of DOS. Additionally, with complete DOS, we actually require several days of NPO or nothing by mouth. Anybody who knows uh, the CF diet and the CF um, systems knows any uh, days with nothing by mouth or any days when they're not eating can cause a lot of weight loss. And so this is something that we see weight loss, malnutrition, muscle mass loss. So this is an important part of the nutrition um, and an important, important impact on nutrition. As I mentioned on the previous slide, part of what we may have to do is really work with our patients to see if there's any change in the diet that's necessary to prevent another episode of DOS. This may be higher diet in fiber, or a higher fiber diet, or a lower fiber diet. This really is an individualized process. Not one CIF gut is the same as the other one. And so this is something that I work with every single one of my patients who has an episode of DOS to figure out what their triggers are. Some people feel like flaxseed is definitely what causes DOS. Some people feel like it's something that helps to prevent it. So it's really working on an individual basis to figure out what works and what doesn't work. So I encourage any of you who have CF and who've had an episode of DOS to really work with your dietitian. It also may require a change in enzymes to uh, prevent any sort of malnutrition, or excuse me, malabsorption. One of the questions I get oftentimes, particularly for my newer CF patients who come to my clinic, is why do I have to talk to you every single time I see you about my stools? Why are you so interested? And beyond the fact that you know it's a good way to break the ice with my new patients and get to know them, it really tells me so much about what's going on with the person and their health. Additionally, talking to my patients about their stooling behaviors, talking to them about what's going on in their gut, helps me assess any potential for constipation, any potential for DOS. If we as a team can prevent any of these issues, prevent any malabsorption, that is something that we want to do 100%. Assessing the adequacy and the appropriateness of the enzyme regimen is part of what I do every single time, and this is also why I talk about stooling every single time I see my patients, whether or not they're taking their enzymes at the correct time, when in the meal, are they taking them at the beginning like they should be, or are they taking them at the end? Are they having greasy stools? Are they having floating stools? All of these things give me an idea of what's going on. Are they taking the appropriate dose? Do I need to adjust their dosing? Are they taking it with the correct foods? These are things that I want to talk about every single time. Additionally, are they, is their bowel regimen adequate for them? As I mentioned previously, every single CF gut is different. I don't treat one of my CFers like the other one. Everybody has a different bowel regimen. And what we really work on is how to make that bowel regimen work for them. And all of these are to prevent DOS, as I mentioned before. So I want to end on when to call your medical team. This is something important because we want to prevent DOS, we want to prevent complete DOS, because again, these have a lot of impact on nutrition. It's important to know to call your medical team if you have CF and you have any kind of bowel issues, any kind of signs and symptoms of increasing abdominal pain, particularly near the belly button or in the lower right quadrant. If you notice any decrease in the number or frequency of stools, or if there's no stool in 24 hours, give your medical team a call, get on top of it, we'll work through it on the, on the phone with you. Any decrease in appetite, feeling of abdominal fullness or nausea vomiting, give your team a call, we can work through it with you. And also any abdominal distension. Anything that's out of the ordinary that you feel is kind of going on, any of these symptoms, give your team a call and we can certainly work through that with you. At this time, I'm gonna hold my questions until the end. I'm gonna pass it off to Sarah, who's gonna speak a little bit more about the medical side of DOS. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. 
if you close there just to move that out. There we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. All right. Okay. So my name is Sarah Maudlin. Many of you know my sister, Anna Maudlin, my family. They're uh, big CF riders. <laughs> Well, I'm an osteopathic medical student. I'm in my fourth year. I go to Toro University. And when I started um, there, I started treating my sister with osteopathic manipulative medicine. She was having a lot of bowel issues. She was hospitalized for DIOS about four times a year for seven years. And I started treating her, and I think she has had one hospitalization in the past like three years or so. Uh, so that with a combination of other preventative measures that she's been working on with her team has really helped her to stay out of the hospital. And as anyone who has had DOS knows, it's a, such an incredibly painful, awful thing to go through. So uh, I was really excited about this potential treatment option. So um, I applied for a grant from CFRI and they have so graciously been able to fund this research that I've been doing. So I um, wanted to present a little bit about what osteopathic medicine is. Uh, so this is my talk. It's on osteopathic treatment and CF DOS and chronic constipation as well. So today we're going to go over a couple of different topics, why we're doing this study, what osteopathic medicine is, uh, what can osteopathic medicine treat? Who can be a part of our study? And what we've found so far. So this study is still ongoing. We're still in the middle of treating patients. So this is just preliminary results. But so doing this study, currently our conventional treatment protocols are, are lacking in some preventative measures as we're still getting patients that are coming into the hospital for DOS. We're getting some great new advances and um, this could possibly be another thing that can help people stay out of the hospital. CF con chronic constipation is becoming increasingly prevalent. Um, and this is for a number of different reasons. Mainly, though, our patients are living longer and longer, which is so fantastic. But as our patients are living longer, they can develop new or worsening symptoms of chronic constipation and DOS. Uh, and as, as we heard earlier from Michelle's talk, uh, this also affects CF patients with and without lung transplantation, and depending on the literature you read, um, and her statistics also showed this, that patients with lung transplantation may actually even have a higher percentage of DOS. Um, depends on the numbers you look at. So osteopathic medicine. Not very many people in California know what osteopathic medicine is. So I'm going to be a DO when I graduate, that is a doctor of osteopathy. Like my MD colleagues, I'm going to be fully licensed. I'm, I can take the same boards, do the same residencies, um, go into any specialty that I would choose. Uh, so osteopathic medicine started with um, Dr. A.T. Still, pictured over here. And he started this in the late 19th century. He was very disillusioned with medicine after losing a number of family members to diseases because of poor medical care at the time. At the time, a lot of the medical care was bloodletting, giving people mercury, purging, things we don't really do today. <laughs> But so he found osteopathic medicine in being able to um, work with the body in a little bit of a different way. So two things that are different in our training with osteopathic medicine rather than our uh, MD colleagues. One is we started off with this holistic approach from day one. Um, always taught to keep in mind mind, body, spirit when we're treating our patients and how incredibly important all of those aspects are. As well as that structure and function are totally interrelated. So anything that's going wrong with our function is going to, um, our structure is going to affect our function. And that leads us into osteopathic manipulative medicine. So osteopathic manipulative medicine is a very gentle, hands-on technique where we can diagnose and treat the body. Um, it mainly is working on a manipulation of joints, soft tissues, and viscera, or which is also your internal organs. So it, works to optimize a bunch of different systems, such as your musculoskeletal system, circulatory, lymphatics, and your nervous system. So what do I mean by working on your nervous system? It sounds like a pretty hard thing to work on just with your hands. So there's a couple of different ways. One is working on this autonomic nervous system. So now your autonomic nervous system, this is your fight and flight and rest and digest. So for sympathetics, that's your fight and flight, and parasympathetics is your rest and digest. So what we can do is we want to keep our parasympathetics 
up, right? We want that digestion to be occurring. We want peristaltic motion in the gut to be happening. So with osteopathic medicine, what we can do is, does this work on here? Oh, no, not quite. Yeah. It does it? Oh. Nope. Okay. Well, oh. Aha. <laughs> so we can see over here for our parasympathetics, they come out at two places. So one is right at the base of the skull and also down at the tip of the spinal cord. So we can work in these areas to stimulate activity. Then we want to go over to our sympathetics which is right over here. So this is in the thoracics down to our high lumbar area. And what we can do with osteopathic medicine is work on inhibiting those nerves to bring them back down, to keep our fight and flight system at bay. Another way we work on the nervous system is with viscerosomatic reflex. This is a little bit of a complicated idea. But, so this is a way we can um, diagnose and treat. So what can happen is when our viscera, such as a heart, maybe we're having a heart attack, our cells are dying, they're sending off a signal, we have to tell the brain, right? So we get this, ooh, where did it go? We get a signal coming from the heart all the way back into the spinal cord. And we know that the heart is innervated from T1 to T4. So we can find those vertebral segments and look there. And what happens when when these nerves that are hyperreactive are coming back in, they can cross-react with other nerves that are entering in at that same spinal level, such as the nerves that innervate the skin and the musculature at the back, right at that spot. So they can cause these tissue texture changes. They might be hard, firm, it might be boggy and edematous, it might um, be sweaty or, or slippery. And all these different changes can show us and have, give us an insight into what's happening on, in our internal organs. Um, so with OMT, one, we can use that to sort of give us hints as to what's going on in the body, but we also work to optimize the function of those nerves coming in at those spinal levels, so we can tone down that somatic reflex as well. Another part of this study, a big part of this, is our visceral manipulation. We're working directly with the colon primarily, um, doing myofascial release, and we're trying to get at any adhesions or restrictions that are found to optimize that colon in being able to peristalse and move that um, stool around. We also go through and stimulate a peristaltic motion, and it also physically manipulates any fecal blockages. Another important component with what we're working on is our lymphatic system. So the lymphatics um, contain fluid. This is extra fluid that's in our body, and it also contains our immune cells. So obviously very important for our CF population. And how we work with lymphatics is in a couple of different ways. Number one, we want to make this system um, the most optimized. We want to open up any restrictions that might be there. So we work on a couple of different places such as your thoracic inlet. This is a common choke point. We want to get the diaphragm moving as much as we can. Not only is this good for pumping the lymphatics, but it's also good for um, moving the, the intestines as well. Every time we take a deep breath in, our diaphragm descends, and it makes our organs descend as well. Then we also go through and encourage lymphatic drainage out of the bowels, going through and milking some of that uh, lymph fluid that's any extra lymph fluid that's in the abdomen out. So our study, it's composed of weekly surveys, and we have four OMT treatments that are happening one month apart. It's a crossover study design. We have two groups. Our first group is completing four months of surveys, and then they complete four months of treatments with concurrent surveys. Our second group completes four months of treatments with surveys, and then an additional four months of surveys. So who can be a part of the study? So anyone with the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis, symptoms of constipation, and taking at least one medication for bowel symptoms. Um, exclusion criteria, currently on an organ transplant list, we want patients to focus on that if they need to and not worry about our study. Um, any issues with non-compliance with pancreatic enzymes, because as we learned from Michelle, that can actually cause up blockages. 
And then with FEV1 less than 40. So we are still recruiting, and if anyone is interested, please email me or ask any questions. And with CFRI's generous support, we're able to offer $200 for completion of our study. So if anyone's interested, please let me know. So ultimately, number one, we want to see if there is an effect with OMT and CF diosynchronic constipation. Um, but number two, and this is where we're going to go after we complete this pilot study, is I would like to develop a treatment protocol that we can teach to families to take it home. Because it's very difficult to find osteopathic physicians and go regularly. Uh, but if we can develop a protocol that can be taught and used regularly, regularly at home, maybe we can prevent a lot more hospitalizations. So in our study right now, what we're looking for, um, one, we're looking for structural diagnosis. Cystic fibrosis is not a disease that has been studied very much in osteopathic literature. So what I mean by structural diagnosis, um, so looking at rib motion, possibly diaphragmatic motion. Is there any difference in pre and post transplant patients? Uh, what about the abdomen? Is there anything interesting going on with, with the hepatic flexures where the, where the colon is attaching to the abdominal walls? Um, and what we've found so far on, on our structural diagnosis was actually kind of interesting that with our uh, non-transplanted patients that are using the vest, their ribs are very restricted and they don't have good excursion. Uh, we're also looking for increase and decrease in pain if they have a change in their laxative use while, while on the study. And then frequency and consistency of stools with our beautiful Bristol stool chart, <laughs> uh, as well as any hospitalizations for constipation and DOS. So, so far, again, preliminary data, still treating our patients, but so far we've had three out of five subjects that have showed decrease in pain while being treated. One showed, or a couple showed up to 25% increase in um, pain-free weeks. Uh, so the reason why this is not five, one has yet to complete the survey portion, and the other one had very minimal pain, so it was hard to assess if they actually had a decrease in pain for the duration of the study. Uh, patients have also sh uh, told us and give us feedback about somatic pain. Um, there has been relief of back pain and sciatic pain from the treatments. We had three subjects report there was immediate relief of abdominal pain post-treatment. Satisfaction of bowel movements has also increased. Four out of five of our patients reported uh, more numbers of weeks of feeling quite happy, which was their highest scale, um, so while they were being treated. Our laxative use, uh, what we, how we measured this one was we looked at hopefully everyone was being regular with their laxative use. And if they ever felt backed up and had to increase their dosage, we were looking at the number of times they increased dosage. So here, we found that four out of five subjects did not need to use additional laxatives while being treated. One subject really had a dramatic de decrease in needing to use extra laxatives. They had nine weeks of increased dosages prior to being treated, and then when they were in the treatment phase, they had zero extra laxative use. So hospitalizations, we've had one hospitalization for DOS while they were in the non-treatment or our control phase, and we've had no hospitalizations for DOS while our patients have been in the treatment phase. So in summary, while in our um, OMT study, most of our patients have shown that there was a decrease in pain, that there was an increase in their satisfaction with their bowel movements, they had a decrease in laxative use, and there has been no hospitalization so far while they've been being treated. So again, we're still recruiting, so I'd love to hear from you if you're interested. And I wanted to give, again, a big thank you to CFRI for supporting this research. It's been very fun to, to go through, thanks to Toro University, um, and thanks to my uh, colleagues that have been uh, helping with the study. And I believe we are on to questions for both Michelle and I. Right. We'll have Sue back up. That was terrific. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Very good. Why don't you stay here? Stay here. And Michelle, why don't you come up? Because there will be questions from the audience and from our online participants. And so if the two of you can squeeze in together, get cozy. But that was both of you very fascinating information. Thank you so much for sharing mm -hmm. with us. And if you have a
question, we need to use the mic so our online viewers can hear. Fantastic. Uh, Sarah, when you were talking about right toward the end of the uh, no di increase in uh, laxative take, intake, and mm -hmm. what what is kind of the baseline of what they're telling you, or is that all over the ballpark too? Um, it's all over the ballpark. So we're going off of what their individual baseline is. If they had to increase from from their regimen that they have set up with their CF center. Okay. So then, uh, Michelle, then some of them are on laxatives all the time. Yes. There's a lot of our patients who are on uh, laxatives almost every day. Um, uh, most of them with any recurrence or any episode of DOS will be on a, definitely a bowel regimen. Has there been any study or signs that that may create a weakening in say the uh, 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 walls and the, uh, particularly the colon muscles? Or That's a good question. Um, I don't know of any studies. Um, really the one that we use most often is um, Miralax and that really just hydrates the gut um, mm -hmm. so it shouldn't have any weakening effect um, but I don't know of any studies that do show that. Okay, thank you. Um, this may not come under your uh, um, responsibilities but we have a family member who actually does not have cystic fibrosis but has a CF gut mm. and uh, enzymes help a little bit but she's chronic constipation and um, she'll get uh, she'll get backed up so I guess the question is with the osteo I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. It's a new word for it me, Sarah, word. and I appreciate yeah. it. So, <laughs> my question is for her: Is that would this would be a way to go? Definitely. Possibly. So okay. So, uh, there's a number of different ways that you can um, find osteopathic physicians that can do treatments like this. So this is just one study, but they're all over the area. I can give you some names. Um, also, this will be in Virginia. <laughs> I can give you names in Virginia too. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have a question. Uh, Michelle, you had mentioned about blood sugar levels, maintaining them for as part of bowel health, and that's something that I had never really thought about, and I was wondering if you could share more information. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Um, so in terms of blood sugars, we do see that patients who have very high blood sugars over a long period of time, um, they can have stickier blood, um, just kind of at baseline. I like to tell our patients it's like having a piece of gum on their shoe and walking through the hospital or walking through dirt. You have a lot of things that are collected on there and it's kind of sticky. Um, and this can actually be in your gut as well. It can slow down the gut and this is why oftentimes blood sugar issues can cause a slowed gut um, and also kind of slowed motility through um, the gut. So that's where blood sugar control is a big part of prevention of DOS. Okay. I have a few online questions. Um, do you have any tips or natural approaches to improving muscle function in the GI tract? Improving muscle function, interesting. Um, well, so that's one thing that we're trying to work on. I think muscle function meaning peristaltic motion. Um, and, and that's one thing for, you know, you always could try osteopathic medicine to help increase that peristaltic motion to move that fecal blockage or just stool around. Um, I don't know if you have any other. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it would actually help with the uh, actual muscle tone in the gut, but one of the things that we do actually ask a lot of our patients who have any kind of episodes of constipation or DOS is really get out and walk around as mm -hmm. much as they can. Any kind of movement will help move things in the gut. And so, as I mentioned earlier in my um, presentation, we see when our patients are more sedentary, this is when we have more occurrence of constipation. So I don't think it will help with the muscle tone itself, but it certainly can help move things along in the mm -hmm. gut. Um, this question um, is in reference to something you said earlier. What was the baseline hospita hospitalization rate prior um, to entering prior entering to the study? Baseline hospitalization rate. Um, it varies for each of our participants. Um, we originally had wanted our patients to have had um, at least one hospitalization in the past year to show some change, but we dropped that to um, open it up to more patients. So it varies between each, each subject. 
I have been recently diagnosed with um, Dios. I have not tried colon hydrotherapy, but do you think it would be helpful? I'm just looking into alternative therapies for management of regular chronic constipation. Um, colon hydrotherapy is something that uh, I wouldn't recommend without talking to your medical team. Um, it's hard to really say yes or no to that question without knowing the background of the patient, without knowing the background of um, really their own GI health. Um, but if it's something you want to look into, certainly check with your team before going forward and doing that because there can be other uh, things that can occur with any kind of hydrotherapy. So I, I would recommend checking with your CF team before going forward with that. If you had any other? Um, yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Sarah, does it hurt <laughs> oh, when you're treated? doing the whole manipulation? Oh, no, it feels really good. I love getting treated. <laughs> Sarah, can you say what's the minimum age to participate in your study? So right now it's 18. We have been working on getting our IRB to to allow us to um, have kids, but have not yet gotten that approved. Okay, I have a question. Um, is there a relationship between gastroparesis and the incidence of dios, dios? Have either of you studied that? Or have there um, been any studies? There are definitely studies. Um, I don't have any specific references as to right now, but I, I believe that with the slowing of the gut and um, the slowing of gastroparesis is a slowing, delayed emptying of the gut. Um, and it can have to do with peristalsis only in the stomach. It can also affect the intestines. Um, so I can't tell you a specific correlation, but I can uh, empirically say that there are some patients that I see who have in, uh, gastroparesis who do have more episodes of DOS, um, but I would have to look into more studies to tell you any numbers or any facts for sure. Great, thank you. Thank you. You talked a little bit, Sarah, um, sorry, Michelle, about the change in the rate of um, incidence of DOS post-transplant. Can you talk a little bit more about why that is, like what might cause it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so after transplant, there's a lot of medications that are on board that, um, pain medications, for example, and a lot of changes that happen. We do see blood sugar spikes after transplant as well because of a lot of steroids that are on board. Um, and again, the blood sugar issues can definitely slow the gut. Um, also, sometimes with the gastroparesis, as you had asked, uh, Sue, that can be on board. And just overall slowing of the gut can definitely um, increase the incidence of DOS after transplant. There's just a lot of physiological changes that also occur. So we see not a huge spike in increase, um, but there are definitely a slightly increased um, incident because of those issues. Um, I have another online question for Sarah. Um, where is osteopathic medicine or therapy available? It is available all over the country. Um, so for some, well, for uh, political reasons, um, osteopathy is not really talked about in California. We lost a lot of people transitioning at, from DOs to MDs at one point in time. So that's why you don't hear about a lot of osteopathic physicians in California. Um, other places, such as on the East Coast and in the South, there are many osteopathic physicians there and it's much more likely for you to go to your primary care doctor to be a, a DO there. Um, as far as looking at practitioners, one, if you want to be a part of our study, please, please do that. Um, but also there's a number of um, online organizations that can give you some links, um, such as the American Academy of Osteopathy. Um, that's a good one to go look up and you can find osteopathic physicians to get treated. Is DOS, it's much more common in older patients, or do you see it a lot in pediatric patients? And is there a different kind of assessment to track whether they're experiencing this? That's a really great question. Unfortunately, I only work with CF adults, and so most of my research only focuses on CF adults. Um, I believe there is an increased incidence in CF adults. Um, 
in that, you know, as you age, your gut does slow down at baseline. Um, but that would be something that I believe <laughs> our guest will be able to answer. Yeah. So I'm a pediatric gastroenterology fellow here at Stanford. Um, and so DOS as sort of the entity that we described is more common in adults. We see a lot of constipation in our um, pediatric population um, and certainly meconium ileus which is um, there at birth or nearly after um, birth is essentially dios in the infant um, but uh, you know I think for reasons for a variety of reasons and some that are not uh, totally understood um, diagnoses of dios is more common in adults but we um, like our adult colleagues are always talking about our patient's stools and adjusting their um, stools to keep them regular and uh, trying to eliminate uh, abdominal discomfort that may be a result of malabsorption, um, you know, poor stooling, um, and also in a lot of our kids also um, creating good um, defecating uh, mechanics. So being in positions that sort of help aid the passage of stools. Thank you. And now that I think of occasional times that I've been on antibiotic, always in the instruction, see, here's a side effect that may be, and uh, constipation or blockage is one of them. Have they tried to correlate some of the, you know, as you well know, we, everybody in this group knows, CF and antibiotics are great friends. Mm -hmm. Has there been uh, any study to try to see just how much that aggravates the deals where it's caused, the deals is caused by other factors as well, but. I am happy to. You can fill that one. That's fine. So I don't know of any specific studies, but from working, I have a, about 400 patients that I do follow at Stanford, and I can tell you that 50% have a lot of diarrhea with con with um, IV antibiotics and 50% have constipation. Not obviously exact numbers, but you know it really depends on the person. Some people really get constipated when they're on IVs and some people get really a lot of loose stools. So it's really working with that patient and making sure that they know what their symptoms are when they are on IV antibiotics before any kind of constipation or any kind of episodes and making sure the team knows that and that as soon as we start antibiotics, we start them usually on a probiotic if, if they can. Um, and then also we make sure their bowel regimen is in place. Um, and we keep really good records of our patients and making sure we know what their symptoms are. And so we make sure we prevent that when they are on IVs. You mentioned probiotics. So I'm just curious, is that why, that to me seems like it should be a regular part of the regimen. Is that for most patients recommended that they are using probiotics, not just when they're on antibiotics, mm -hmm. extra antibiotics? I'm a very big proponent of probiotics in our CF patients. Um, I believe it really does help with um, regularity of the gut and also um, just gut health in general. Um, there are some contraindications after transplant, so we don't always say after transplant it's okay. It usually we have some rules and regulations. It depends on the patient again, but prior to transplant, I would love to have every single one of my patients on probiotics. The problem with probiotics is you really have to be regular about them, and you have to take it every single day, and it takes about a month really to have an effect, um, a consistent effect, and it's, it's hard because, as you all know, our CFers take a ton of medications and adding one more into the day sometimes is just something that they just aren't willing to do and nobody can fault them for that. Um, especially when it's one of those things that it takes a month to really have an effect and feel better um, from. So um, I would love to incorporate into every single one of my patients, but unfortunately it just isn't possible all the time. So I have another question about the probiotics. Um, if you've used them regularly prior to a transplant, and then post-transplant, you cannot use them. Is there anything that you rec you can recommend to replace the probiotics? Um, after transplant, we are seeing, there are certain probiotics that are an absolute no, an absolute contraindication after transplant. We are, s it depends on the center, the CF center, whether or not they are okay with certain probiotics. Um, if it's a no to probiotics after transplant, a lot of the times it's just because of all the good bacteria that's in those probiotics, you know, when you have a transplant, your immune system is suppressed, and so even introducing good bacteria can be overwhelming for the system. 
Um, I usually talk to patients about other ways to get probiotics through food, and there are definitely certain foods. Everybody knows yogurt is a good probiotic um, property, so different ways to kind of incorporate that into their diet on a day-to-day -day basis, and usually those patients, I'm lucky enough to be able to follow our patients before and after transplant, and so those who have had a really good effect of probiotics before transplant, I usually work with them after transplant to transition them. If they can't actually go on to a probiotic regimen after transplant, I transition them into a food probiotic regimen. Is there a length of time after transplant when it's not really it's a safer? hard and fast rule, unfortunately. Um, we usually see, you know, it, it depends on the center, um, but if they're having a lot of GI discomfort and um, issues after transplant without their probiotics, we certainly talk to the team and try and incorporate it if the physicians feel it's appropriate. Thank you. Enzymes, of course, are key for part of the prevention. And we all know that people can be very adherent to their enzymes. And for whatever reason, there are period, periods of malabsorption. And then things normalize again. Sometimes it doesn't seem to go back to the way it was. And how, how do you track, how do you know when it's time to try maybe a different kind of enzyme just mm -hmm. to see if there's a, a better response? That's a great question, and you are absolutely right. Even with the most compliant patient, sometimes they just malabsorb. They're taking them perfectly appropriately. Um, I have about 25 questions I ask of my patients. I quiz them as to if they know when they should take their enzymes, what foods they should take their enzymes with. Um, one of the things that I've found with a lot of my patients is um, little things like they're storing them in the wrong place, for example. They put them in the garage, They're, they put them in a fridge, <laughs> for example. Um, we see that the storage is super important. Maybe they have them in their pocket and they have their dosing in their pocket that you know they travel with. And because enzymes are really a protein, there's, they're kind of, um, they have to be in specific temperatures and stored properly. So those are one of, that's one of the 25 questions I ask my patients. Um, if I go through the entire list of questions and every single thing is proper, they're doing everything like they should be and they're not expired and they're not stored improperly, then, you know, we can always tweak the enzyme dosage, maybe go up a little bit. I don't like to go up and up too much though because there is obviously issues with going too high. Um, so if they're doing everything exactly the way they should be, they're on a good um, regimen, they're on lots of other medications that may help with other um, factors that can actually help improve the um, absorption of their enzymes and it just isn't working, that's when we really try changing to a different enzyme. And some people, it works perfectly. Um, some people, they change to a different enzyme and they don't like it. So it's really working with the team and kind of asking the questions and going through it. And you know, honestly, this is when it might be a 30 minute conversation with me about the bowel movements and the bowel regimen. Um, but you know, we will switch it if we think it's appropriate, definitely. Some people though are married to their enzymes and they do not want to switch. And so if that's the case, we work with them and figure out how to make those enzymes work. Wow, that really very, very um, thoughtful questions from the audience. Thank you very much. And to Michelle and Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. I mean, it's a fascinating insight from both of you on how to treat you know, abdominal issues and gastroenterology issues, and really fascinating. Thank you very much. So thank you all for being here with us tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank again our sponsors, uh, Vertex and Genentech, and also Abvi and uh, Kiesa USA, and to recognize also CF Services Pharmacy. Um, they're a, a Walgreens Alliance Pharmacy now, and they could not be with us tonight. But we appreciate you all coming, and I hope you return next month on March 8th. We will be featuring Dr. Jeffrey Wine, who is the director of the CF Research Laboratory at Stanford, and he will be discussing, um, I think, really a very interesting topic, youngsters with cystic fibrosis, an argument for, for treating while healthy. So why should we wait until they're sick? And so we'll have some answers to that next month. So thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. Stay and enjoy some, some goodies. Take a look at some of the, the documents and information and make yourself at home. And really, thank you for being with us tonight. Will that be here?
Yes, that will be here. From now on, it will be here. Yes, we. This is this is the home of the CF Discovery Series in our office. I, you were Ed. You'll have to learn the new way to the office. So thank you.